Welcome to the Keenan Yoga Podcast. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Today's guest is Dr. James Mallison, a well-established expert in philology, which is a study of language or Sanskrit as a scholar, studying the ancient yoga-related texts. So we didn't plan to spend half an hour of our chat talking about how to p- perform Vajroni Mudra, the practice of sucking up fluids through the penis, a common in tantric practice. But we did, and yet... This is what happens when you have a spontaneous and unscripted chat. A real peek inside, in fact, the world of someone who didn't start yoga as an academic at all. Actually, they went to India, quite the other way around, and Jim went on a gap year when he was 17. We do gap years in England before university. And he had a place at Oxford. And having spent a year in India, he endeavoured through his studies, his further studies at Oxford and beyond, to just do some work that would get him back there. So all his... Efforts were and to create some field work that would allow him to do that field work back in India, which indeed was exactly what he did. And his PhD was on this Kachari mudra, which is another mudra, not so rude, another crazy yogic practice. This time it's sticking the tongue up the back of the throat um, to connect to the soft palate. And um, it's esoteric, and there's a reason. <laughs> and in pursuing his research for this, he became initiated as a sadhu or in a certain lineage of ascetics, and one of the only initiated Westerner in that lineage. So this led him for years, actually, years and years. He spent traveling around India, coming back subsequently, now and again, off and on, um, to Oxford University. But traveling around India for many years with his guru um, as a nomadic renunciate, basically. So it's a really unique experience, both an academic, but, you know, first and foremost, really, um, you know, a practitioner in India of this renunciate, uh, what do you call them, it's an initiate, initiate lineage of sadhus. So Jim is another Really unique story. Come off of the acclaimed book Roots of Yoga with Mark Singleton, professor professor of Indology at SOAS, SOAS University, very esteemed in London, currently compiling a long-weighted publication with uh, Mark and also Jason Birch called The Hatha Yoga Project. So that'll be out shortly. Jim was an utter pleasure to interview. We had a real fun, unbelievably down to earth and humble, incredibly so given his remarkable experience. He provides an absolute wealth of meticulously researched information Really, it's my go-to person now for any question I have on the origins of yoga, apart from Vajroli Mudra, indeed. <laughs> so we did get stuck, uh, stuck into, stuck over. <laughs> we got stuck over Vajroli Mudra, but stuck into more relatable questions as well. The origins of yoga, the uses of yoga asana historically, and as they've evolved over the ages. Now living in Wiltshire, UK, having cut his dreadlocks, in fact, he always had dreadlocks, after his guru's passing, this is what you do when your guru passes away, and he's bringing up a young family now with his wife. So I'll let you listen until the end for his guilty pleasure <laughs> with bated breath. And just tell you, Keelan Yoga is a labour of love, as they say. And we don't expect financial support, but always we appreciate it. Don't you? So feel free to head on to our website and donate on the podcast page. And don't forget to review us on iTunes. Also, we started the podcast as a discussion, an interactive endeavour. So please feel free to show, share and comment and give us ideas of who you want to be interviewed next right get involved any way you can right i'll let you listen now okay welcome jim to the king yoga podcast Um, thanks for coming on thank you very much for having me adam it's it's an honor i've enjoyed listening to lots of your podcast it's yeah, great to be here myself. I kind of know that you've actually listened to them and now I'm very nervous that um, you might be listening potentially to any of them <laughs> um, you, actually I, I should get less nervous as I do but actually unfortunately I get more nervous as they become more popular and more people listen the, um, you know, the pressure builds um, <laughs> so how and why did you get into yoga do you want to because obviously we know your academic background, but um, I never, yeah, I never known how you actually got into the practice of yoga. That's, I suppose it's quite a long story. I mean, well, I, I found myself in India, age seventeen. I went off on my gap year, and I wasn't. In fact, I was 
Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't into yoga at the time. And I remember meeting a guy who was in Kovalam Beach, right in the far south of India. And he was probably about 40. Richard, really nice guy, sort of English hippie type. And he was trying to get me into it then. And I was somewhat dismissive. And I, I don't think I actually did anything then. But then when I came back to England at the end of that first trip, and I was sort of, I'd, I'd got the India bug and... Uh, I was back studying Sanskrit. And I remember, yeah, I did then get quite into it. I mean, mainly at the beginning, mainly self-taught. I've only ever been to a couple of actual yoga classes. But then, then you know, ended up um, living with yogis in India and learning. Is that how you learn? Because I've seen your your postures. Yeah. You're definitely quite good. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Coming from one of you guys, who's Ashtangis, that's, that's a high praise. I, I remember it was fine. Someone actually wrote a, wrote a, uh, you know, put something in an academic article having seen me doing a not very straight headstand compared to my colleague Mark Singleton doing a very kind of rigid, perfect headstand. And, uh, they, they seem to, they, they read quite a lot into that and they, and I said, no, I think it's just me being sloppy. I don't think you can really infer too much about the Indian tradition from that. Although having said that, I mean, yeah, the you know the the, the yogis I've spent time with in India, they're not that hung up on the form of the asanas and so forth. So yeah, maybe there was something in it. But yeah, and I was also thinking about it when I was at school. I um I had uh, a drama teacher, and I didn't realise at the time, but thinking back, she was definitely making us do uh, yoga nidra. So I think that was probably my first exposure and I, and it stuck with me. So I obviously enjoyed that. But yeah, I was a bit ambivalent and then then got right into it at age 17, 18, once I started hanging out with, with yogis in, in India. I remember I still got a scar actually on my shin from uh, trying to learn to do a headstand in my tiny little room in Oxford when I was an undergrad and I fell over and scraped my shin along on this chest. <laughs> That reminds me of my early days. And so you're mainly self-taught or, or taught with the, through hanging out with sadhus basically in India? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's a mixture, I suppose, of um, of reading from books and hanging out with, with sadhus in India. I mean, they would say the same, actually. It's interesting. Sometimes they... Um, you know, there's a saying that the teacher is the samaj amongst the yogis and you could pick and choose bits from here and there because, uh, you know, the, you're not expected necessarily to copy everything that your guru does. And if they think that you're, you know, you should, there's other things that you should learn, but it's not, um, that they're not the person to teach you. You can get sort of sent off to someone else mm, to, mm, to mm. learn it. So, so I learned Ketri Mudra, although my guru didn't do it. My guru didn't do it, so he... Yeah, but he put me in touch with other yogis who did. So okay, you've actually you've actually learnt it in the end, Kichiri Mudra, because I know you were you were inquiring about it, and you, a lot of your yeah, yeah. Of your I've, work, I've learned them all. I've pretty much all right. Of it. So a lot of your work was actually centred on that in the early days, I think. Didn't you? Wasn't it? Um, the, yeah, that was my my PhD. So yeah, to sort of so, I mean, my my um, you know, my the the, the thing that drives me in my hanging out in India and my work together is a, is a sort of fascination and a love for that whole sadhu tradition. And I ended up, so I wanted to, you know, I've always kind of kept the two things going, the living living in India with yogis and sadhus and the academic side of it. And so in order to keep going with that, when I wanted to do a PhD, I needed to find a topic that would, uh, you know, work for me, that would help you know, a something that that was going to work as as a as a PhD project, and B that would kind of have be relevant to that world of sadhus that I like living in. So I still had an excuse to go back and do six months field work every year. And uh, is in terms of and I and I decided I wanted to use Sanskrit for that. I'd, I'd done anthropology as a, an MA, but I wasn't. I'd sort of got a bit stuck in all the theory and all of that. So I decided to go back to Sanskrit. So I needed to find a Sanskrit text. So I wanted to edit a text from manuscript, you know, a text that hadn't been published before. And there was a really good, good group of people in Oxford at the time doing that under my supervisor, Alexis Sanderson. And so that I, then the only texts really that were relevant to that world I was, uh, I'd been living in in India were the ones on, on yoga, on Hatha Yoga. So I chose this text on, uh, on Kitchen. What's, te- what's the name of the text? And, and got stuck in. I didn't and, know there was uh, actually a... a- a particular the text is called the Ketri Vidya. 
Yeah, yeah, it's the it's the only text purely devoted to Ketri Mudra. It's an you know, it's a, like like many Indian texts, it's hard to work out its at, its actual origins. It seems to have come from an earlier text that talked about because the the word vidya can mean science, but it can also mean like a, a, a mantra for a female deity. So at the heart of the text is this really cryptic description of a mantra, which I don't think I ever cracked actually. Um, it was, you know, it's, it's presented in a puzzle, but then that was expanded to include all the teachings on the on the tongue practice. <laughs> you actually, I mean, it was kind of amazing. You, so you you say you've mastered you, you've mastered the Kachari Mudra now. I wouldn't say I've mastered it, no, <laughs> but I mean I still do. I do it probably did, every day, pretty did much. You the, did you do um, the cut, the frenum cutting? I did do the frenum cutting, yeah. Although I, it's pretty much healed back. I think more important than the cutting of the frenum is is stretching the palate at the back to be able to get the tip of the tongue up in there. I was going to say over uh, interviewing Shandor, and um, and he kind of mentions that when he when he finally got it, there was a lot, you know, there was a lot that happened for him. And was that your experience? Did it change anything noticeably in your? Mm. I can't say. I mean, it 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 feels it's it's strange because it's. A, I don't know if 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 you've ever done it or people who are listening have done it. But you really. I mean, it's it's a quantum difference. You totally know when you when you're doing it or not because your tongue suddenly slips up, and it does feel right in some way. Strange enough, it feels like it's meant to happen, which is odd because it's clearly not really meant to happen. I don't know. You know, you couldn't stay like that forever. So yeah. It, it feels good, but no, I can't. I listen to Shandall's podcast, and I can't say I have developed quite such a, 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 an understanding or an appreciation of its effects. It just sort of, it just sort of feels right, as far as that's what I'd say. It's sort of when you're meditating or doing pranayama and so forth. It, it, now, if I don't put my tongue there, it feels wrong. If you see what I mean, and then I, you know, so I find it easy to get into the zone if if I'm in Ketri Mudra. Yeah. How, what is it that fascinates you about hanging out with the Sadis? Because I know you've you know have done a lot of that, and um, you're initiated, right? You're initiated in a particular branch, and maybe you could speak a little bit about that and your experiences there. Yeah, I think you know I've, of, I've often asked myself this question. I haven't completely cracked it, but you know, I grew up. I, I don't know. I'm probably a bit older than you. I don't know, but I, I was born in 1970, and so I came of age in the 80s. No, I'm nine yeah, years old. Yeah, okay, got a lot yeah, older yeah. than you then. So you 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 missed out on my, my formative years. You know my kind of musical influences and so. I, mean, I was sent off to boarding school, age well actually sent off at se- age seven. But then when I went to senior school at twelve, I came back. You know, I was boarding school. I came back and the, my parents said, you know, what do you want to decorate your room with? And I said, uh, I want a, a poster of Sid Vicious. And they were, they were pretty upset. <laughs> they were quite surprised anyway. So I got sort of joint influences in the 80s of of punk and the kind of hippie hangover. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I missed that. Do you, you know, there's that sort of weird crossover. Yeah, of, absolutely. Of the, yeah, yeah. You, you would have missed that. But then, so I was kind of into both aspects of it. And then when I went off to India and met these, you know, these crazy charismatic uh, sadhus who hang out who are like a sort of embodiment of both attitudes this is a pe- peace and love of the hippies and the, and they're a bit punk as well they're a bit like you know s- screw screw everything up yours to everything so I, that that strongly appealed to me and also the whole you know i just loved uh, wandering around india um you know that's what i've uh, still probably when i'm at my happiest is wandering around india going to new places and you know, just because it's just such a a treasure trove. I mean, there's uh, also as a as a a scholar or someone interested in the in the, the 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 history, the traditions of India. They're still alive. That's the amazing thing. You know, you can study. You know, there are things from texts two thousand years old that are still still relevant today. The same places are still there's still temples, and the lifestyles haven't changed that much, particularly for the ascetics. So it's just sort of feeling like you're wandering around part of this still. Uh, still existing ancient ancient landscape, this kind of ancient uh, connection, and um, I think that yeah, there's that, and and of course the the sadhus themselves are constantly wandering around. So that I've slotted in 
slotted into that life quite well. It was the end of my first trip, actually. It was about, I had a few weeks before I was going to go back to England and I wanted to go up to, uh, in Kashmir. I didn't actually quite have time to go and do the Amranath Yatra. So there's this big ice lingam in a cave at 4,000 meters. And, uh, because my visa was running out, I realized I wouldn't have time to walk up there and back, but I ended up spending a few days in a camp with some sadhus there. And that was it. That was the kind of, that was the, the thing that I just thought these guys are, it's, it's just fasc fascinating and such fun. You know, they're charismatic and exciting and sort of irreverent and naughty and also embodying this ancient tradition. And I, I was hooked. And so from then on, every time I went back, I would go and search out sadhus and, um, yeah. And then eventually then decided in 90, I've got, still got this diary and, uh, there was a terrible, terrible rave song. I remember called by, uh, someone called Guru Josh called 1990 time for the guru. <laughs> I don't, I don't it was, remember. You know, it was all part of the whole party scene in England at the time. And I wrote, I wrote that in my, in my sort of notebook diary and then headed off to India. And I said, this is now I, I need to find a guru. If I really want to get properly into this tradition, I need to find a guru. And so went off to the Kumbh Mela in um, Bujain. That would have been, yeah, that was 92, I think, by the time uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that I got there. And of course, the Kumbh Mela is like, you know, it's where all the, all the bubbles come together. It's the best place to go and find yourself a teacher. And uh, through various long sort of roundabout story, ended up in this, in this camp, uh, staying with one sadhu there, but there was another sadhu sort of more, more, uh, more appealing to me and, uh, in, in the camp and ended up sort of jumping ship and moving to his, his camp, much to the irritation of the guy I was with. And, uh, that was it. He then, I kind of got initiated by mistake. I didn't really know what was going on because my Hindi wasn't that great. And we got my, so my then girlfriend, now wife, we got taken off in the middle of the night to Omkareshwar and initiated on the banks of the Narmada and, you know, given a mantra and given a Tulsi. And uh, yeah, that was that. And then we spent the, probably the best part of the next 10 years in India, wandering around with, um, with our guru. And what, what was it appealed uh, about this particular guru that attracted you? Well, <laughs> he was, I mean, he's, yeah, very sadly, yeah, he died a couple of years ago, too young. He's probably not even 60. I'm not really sure how old he was. Um, that's, you know, usual sadhu behavior. You don't really know that full origin histories, but he was just hugely charismatic, funny, and just really, I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but I think in the West, we're constantly trying to work out who we are and establish some kind of identity. And there are so many choices available to us. What path do we go down and sort of jumping from one to the other and not really sure what we're doing. Whereas he just embodied, you know, he was someone who knew exactly what they were doing and did it to the absolute limit of um you know he just lived his life perfectly and and had no doubts about where he was or what he was doing he was very kind um very funny very charismatic you know he could just hold a hold a crowd of 50 people he you know he, he would wander around a lot but then he had a couple of his own little ashrams but they were small and they weren't you know you didn't really have any other foreign disciples or anything like that I didn't speak english and uh but his his ashrams would be like the sort of in a way, like the village pub, of course, there was no booze, but like all the, the, in the evenings, all the men of the village would just come and hang out and just be entertained and charmed. And they just sort of sit there kind of looking at him adoringly and everyone absolutely loved him. And, and, uh, and also at the same time, yeah, he'd become a sadhu when he was probably 11, I, I guess, something like that. He'd run away from home. His mother had died and, uh, didn't get on with his stepmom, so he ran away from home to uh, to Benares, Varanasi, thinking that he would become a musician. And then he met some met some sadhus there, met his guru there, and that's where he was initiated. So he was a, a sadhu from very young age, and quickly became his guru was very very sort of important senior figure in a, in a in the Ramanandi sampradaya, which is a you know, big. Uh, Big, big, uh, lineage of, of yogi. In fact, probably the biggest in India these days. And his, his guru was also a disciple of, uh, a Baba called De Raha Baba, who's very famous, um, you know, pretty wild, uh, yogi Swami. He, 
he used to live on this sort of, in this raised hut, this hut on stilts on the banks of the of the Yamuna in Mathura. But he was, you know, he'd get kind of big politicians and film stars coming for his blessings. And he was also a very accomplished yogi, and so he taught yoga to my guru's guru. And then so that there's a kind of very pucker yoga lineage there. And my so my guru was one of five kind of primary disciples of his guru, but his guru had about a hundred other sadhu disciples. But only my guru and one other were chosen to to have the full sort of yoga teachings given to him. And it's an interesting point, actually. I think people don't really realize. You know, people now, people now, people think, particularly in the West, you know, yoga is for everyone; anyone can do it. But actually, within the sadhu tradition, I kind of did a rough. The rough survey at the last Kumbh Mela I was at, and I reckon it's only about two percent of sadhus really do, you know, proper yoga, and that's because the, you know, the guru will size you up, and really it's for the sort of they basically think you should only start learning it when you're young, and also you've got to be kind of fit. Oh, and so you're talking about asana. So my guru was, um, yo, well, your asana mudra, you know, you name it. So what are the uh, rest of them doing? No, no, physical yoga practice. The rest of them are doing devotional stuff, maybe sco- scholarly stuff. Um, you know, they're still they're still busy, still very busy. It's not like, yeah. you know, there are plenty of other things yeah, you can do. Yeah. Or maybe or maybe you know hardcore hardcore like asceticism. Yeah. You're doing things like so my the lineage that I'm part of the sadhus do what's called guni tap where they Sit surrounded by fires in the in the summer sun. For, they do that for four months every day. Yeah, four months. Pleasant. So not all of them are also doing yoga. Some are. Some are. Yeah, yeah it's pretty hardcore. <laughs> um, but they all say it's great. Actually, they all. Everyone's forever trying to get me to do it. I say, I mean, I'm afraid I've got too many commitments. I can't do that for the next four months. Um, but yeah, he. So he then. So actually, before I'd even met him, uh, our guru, we were sitting uh, at this other sadhu's fire Dhuni at the Kumbh Mela in Ujjain in 92 and he was went walking through the camp our, our soon to be guru we were like oh who's that guy because he looked pretty cool you know he had a sort of tiger skin with him and and he's he was a very uh very good look good looking yeah, man yeah. as well and you know had this aura of charisma and uh the Saudi there was, a, there was someone sitting next to my wife well, now wife, she wasn't at the time, Claudia. And so then you beware of him. If he gets inside you, he will suck out all your energy. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, that was a reference to this practice called Vajroli yeah, Mudra, yeah. Um, you've probably heard of. And he was a he's an expert in that. He'd been taught that by by his guru who'd learnt it from De Raha Baba. So I was in, immediately intrigued. You know, I was already I'd already been reading yoga texts and and everything I could find about yoga and so forth. So I knew about this practice, and I thought, "Wow, there's someone who actually does it." I thought it was just almost kind of mythological. And did he teach point. you it? So that definitely fired my interest as well, and I ended up, uh, yes, yeah. Um, I can't. I definitely haven't mastered it. He mastered <laughs> it, but yeah, I, I, I ended up doing a writing an academic paper on it. it was published a few years ago. It was kind of up through the ether, right? Yeah. Yes. What, what would yeah, be yeah. the purpose of that? Yeah. Well, I've written a very uh, long, detailed <laughs> academic paper on this very subject because I was intrigued by it. Because a lot of things didn't make sense. But, you know, it's one of the things I've realized like, from having worked on Ketri Mudra for my PhD and then d- done a lot of work on Vajroli Mudra as well. Um, you know, you look at these seemingly really esoteric, obscure things, but in order to make sense of them, you really have to understand a huge amount of context about yoga and the history of yoga and what's what's been going on and so forth so in fact what inspired me to really uh start doing proper research on vajroli was a while ago it, i think it was 2012 2013 um there was an article by a guy called william broad do you remember he wrote for, i think for the new york right. times mm-hmm. he'd wrote a few yeah, things yeah. on art on, on on yoga but this was in the wake of uh Probably, you know, one of the f- the first of the recent wave of scandals with John Friend and Anusara, and he uh, basically the, the gist of his article was: it's not surprising, you know, all these sex scandals are not surprising because yoga has always been a sex mm-hmm. cult. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that, I, that that did not make sense from from you know my 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 readings of the subject. So, 
I thought that by looking into Vajroli, because the, the one thing in the texts and in the tradition that does seem to have some connection with sex is Vajroli Mudra. So I thought, right, this is now, I'm, you know, my Babaji knew all about it, so I'd learned, uh, learned about it from him, but I thought I'm really going to look into what this, what this is all about. So that's a lot. So that's, that's, that's why I started looking into it. And what I came to the conclusion was, well, it's, it's quite a long story. The name basically, uh, implies or means that it came from tantric Buddhism. All right. Which is in fact where the, the name Hatha Yoga, the, the term Hatha Yoga first appears in tantric Buddhist texts in the sort of late first millennium, which is a recent discovery. I've been looking into that a lot. Um, and it's used to refer to a kind of slightly unorthodox method of performing sexual ritual in, in tantric Buddhism, in Vajrayana, whereby, because normally the, the man is meant to have an orgasm, okay, he's meant to ejaculate, but the, uh, but this, this Hatha yoga tradition, no, you're meant to prolong it. And, uh, that's meant to be the way of achieving the highest state. But of course that, and, and I, I think one can only infer it's not made explicit, but the technique I think was Vajroli Mudra and the way that works is that, uh, I, for, for this, for, you know, this part of my understanding, I drew on the work of a French scholar called Richard Darmon, who I actually spoke to a very interesting guy. I could tell you some interesting stories about him, but he did some crazy research in sort of tantric, uh, cremation grounds in Bengal and so forth. He's also a, a sort of, but he's a, he's a, he's a doctor. He's medically trained. Anyway, what he reckons is that the, it's the, the, the simple act of, so the, the, the way it's performed and traditionally has been performed is by inserting a, a pipe and normally made out of copper, silver or gold into the penis. And that's necessary uh, to suck liquids up because there's a valve in there which needs to be held open. OK, if you if you don't stick the pipe up, then it's basically impossible. Some people argue against this, but I'm I, I remain unconvinced because. You need to hold this. Otherwise, you'd be in consonant all the time. You know, if you if you didn't have this this valve there, you'd be wouldn't be able to hold on to anything. So you need to stick the pipe up to keep that open, and then you uh, perform. It's I don't know if you know, if anyone's done the yogic method of busty kind of auto end. Yeah. It's basically yeah. similar yeah. Uh, mechanical process by performing nowly and doing some contractions in the perineal region. You create suction and a vacuum, and that then draws. Then you have to stick the end of the pipe into a liquid. And that will draw the, the the liquid up into the bladder, and then you can pee it out again later on. But the so that's a sort of simple cleansing, and that that is one sort of benefit of it supposedly. But the the real purpose, the kind of deep purpose, uh, and the deep the, the way it works, as highlighted by Darmon, this this French guy, is that somehow the the action of sticking the pipe in and out desensitizes a region. What's it called? The Veru Montana. Uh, around the urethra and basically and th and this is this has been shown to be true actually in the case of you know people who have to use medical catheters and so forth if they use if you use yes, it a lot i can imagine you basically yeah. get to a stage where you can't you can't ejac ejaculate oh. apparently so i think that is you know that's the actual that's the reason the ultimate reason for doing it and my guru actually i thought for many years i thought he didn't do it anymore i thought he just mastered it as a you know when he was a young yogi and, and then didn't felt he didn't need to do it anymore, but he he did. He would he told me he'd do it every month or two if he'd been travelling or at a festival and he was feeling a bit kind of out of sorts and worried that he might uh, you know lose his lose his control in some way. He would he would practice Vajroli for a bit and he'd say that was kind of reset him. And he claimed you know never even to have had a, a wet dream. <laughs> he was so he wasn't sexually active. He was that's what he said. Absolutely not. No, no. That's why I was so, you know, t I mean, totally not. You know, I mean, you may think I've rose tinted specs or something, but you could, you know, he was really was, there was no sexual vibe about him at all. He was a proper celibate ascetic. Uh, and I wouldn't say that for, you know, there were plenty of sort of other sardis I've hung out with, you know, because yeah, especially I, as I've spent uh, a lot of the time in India with with Claudia, with my my wife, and so she she can definitely <laughs> sense that. Yeah, you know, yeah, if, uh, yeah. if if Asadi's yeah. been a bit a bit spicy, <laughs> a bit a bit naughty, there's been a few of them. But no, um, I, <laughs> my my guru definitely uh, 
seem completely sexless. I can't, I can't believe we spent all the interview talking about Vajrayana Mudra. It wasn't the way it was going to happen, but I mean, as we go, <laughs> but I don't really care. I mean, everyone's asked you about Hatha Yoga already. We'll get to the meaning of Hatha Yoga in a minute. Um, look, look yeah. um, just to keep on this track, I, everyone's always intrigued about stories of guru. I mean, you must have some stories. You say your, your guru was charismatic and extreme. I mean, can you just give a, you know, a one of story that, you know, really represents that, you know, kind of. My gosh, so many stories. Um, well, on the, on the Vajroli thing, there was a, there's a temple actually where he, 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 he had this amazing place, uh, on a river. It's kind of an island in a in a riverbed in Maharashtra, which only flooded in the monsoon, so most of the time it was dry. But it was a, there was a temple to Dattatreya, Dutt Mandir, on this little island, and that was and he but he'd been coming back. In fact, he'd run away from a Kumbh Mela because he'd had an argument with one of his guru brothers, and he was on the train, and he spotted this temple and just and got off the train at the next station and walked there and started doing his yoga practice. And uh, and then you know because of his charisma and and so forth, the locals got right into him and supported him, so helped him set up this this ashram. But then it was, I, I I wasn't present for this, but I always remember this in the context of Vajroli Mudra. So he uh, and he was he was training hard then, and you can do it with different liquids. And in fact, interestingly, there's a you know, I was looking at some Sanskrit texts on this, and and some of the texts you know the people say you can do it with milk, and then there's one. 18th 19th century commentator says no no of course you can't do it with milk because then you're then it would curdle inside you and you'd be in big trouble hmm. um but uh he did he did that's not true because he used to do it with milk and he 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 did it at this uh at this temple in in maharashtra and then he was spotted by one of the villagers peeing out <laughs> the milk near a tree somewhere <laughs> And so, so that really sealed his, you know, that really made his name. The villager goes running back to the village going, oh my God, the Baba, he pisses milk, he pisses milk. So he was kind of a legend from then on. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I thought of that in the context of Vajroli, gosh, what other stories? I mean. They'll use milk and ghee for anything. And <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. I mean, they say mercury as well. What they, what they use, they'll, they'll use suck up mercury. Well, that's what it says in 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 some text, but I think the 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 I I think you don't want to take it all the way in. I think it just it's a, you, if you can demonstrate that you can move it a little bit, it shows you've got pretty good suction going on. But I reckon if it actually came in, you would be in trouble. <laughs> right. mm. So, um, yeah, it's hard. You know, it's it's hard to ch charisma is a hard thing to sort of you know communicate sure. in a way isn't yeah, it because yeah, it's yeah. just yeah, yeah. hanging out with him it was, it was generally just always entertaining and 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 funny and you sort of felt he was he was quite a black sheep you know he would uh he was a black sheep within his immediate family although because of his sort of charisma and and uh personality um no one would no one would often dare stand up to him so we would be able to turn up to uh ashrams where they would never normally allow foreigners in or anything like that but because right. we were yeah. Babaji, yeah. he would say no no you're yeah, we're, we're staying here and so he could get away with get away with kind of bending the rules quite a you bit you kind of taught yourself hindi after understanding sanskrit i suppose you just kind of bastardized it and it became hindi To some extent, yeah. And then I did do it because after I did a, a degree in Sanskrit, I then had a year or two when I was wandering around India. Then I did an MA at SOAS where I did do a year of you know formal Hindi training. I mean, I went in a, at the advanced level because I already had quite good spoken right. Hindi and did the medieval stuff. But yeah, that's the only, f I've only done one year of formal training. Otherwise, basically I learned it from him, you know, just sitting, listening to him for hours and hours on end for, for, for years. So. Yeah, I think my my intonation is, you know, my vocabulary and, and pronunciation probably owe a lot to my my guru. What was the biggest change, do you think, in your understanding of yoga in hanging out with all of these Indian ascetics? I mean, you say you do a lot of hanging out doing nothing or, you know, they would do yoga practice and then sit by the fire for the, the whole day, you know. Um, yeah, how did that, how did that change mm. your perspective on yoga, you know? Well, I mean, it's in interesting, Adam, in that I, 
you know, unlike my colleagues who work in yoga studies, both sort of historical stuff and the, and the modern material, they, um, most of them, if almost all of them have, have come into it via getting a, a, developing a yoga practice in the West and then getting interested in yoga and then thinking, mm-hmm. right now I want to, um, you know, study its origins and so forth. I kind of came from a slightly different angle in that it, I, I was, it was, it was through India and hanging out with yogis there that I developed an interest in, in studying it. And so for me, it was more a case of finding the, the sort of globalized manifestations, the, the modern yoga manifestations, unfathomable. You know, I couldn't it's quite work out around, yeah. how yeah. it had gone from yeah. what I was experiencing. Yeah, it's the other way around. So in fact, it wasn't wasn't really until I read Mark, Mark Singleton's book, you know, Yoga, yoga Body, that that was like, oh, okay, that's how it's all all come about because it was so different, you know. And there, were, you know, the the sort of developments, the innovations of the twentieth century by these various gurus of the lineages that you know you've been involved with as well, of course. That then all made sense the way Mark Mark set it out because it's it's very different from uh, from the way yoga is practiced by by sadhus traditionally. Okay, I suppose we've reached that time where we have to talk about yoga asana a bit. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what, what, so, what? Are, I mean, nowadays it's very much the yoga asana is very much framed in the context of yoga therapy, right? That it's a you know the, the asana is a therapy for the body, for the for the and very much for the for the material structural body. Um, so, but I mean, look, listening to other stuff that you've done and, and you know and other people as well, originally it seems that first of all the asana was perhaps used as some kind of form of tapas or some kind of sort of karmic penance or p- perhaps even prior to that it's uh, ass as a seat as a seat just a, a similarly held rigid posture for meditation um and then you know um, can you just talk a little bit about that and confuse up these kind of three three ways that we take asana and the most recent way being the therapeutic way i suppose I suppose Yeah, no, I think that I think well, you've you've I think I think you've kind of done a nice summary of my current thinking. I mean, I've I've changed my understanding a bit, or, or quite a lot actually. In the over the course, I had this big research project with Mark and Jason Birch and Daniela Bevilacqua for the last five years, uh, looking at the history of Hatha Yoga, physical yoga in particular. And w- at the start of the project, my thinking was that. Um, the more well, you, you, you say therapeutic asana, I suppose that is one way of looking at it. But also, you know, there are uh, these uh, sort of distinctive change in asana practice where you see the appearance of balancing postures. Basically, postures, it's hard to think of a good word that um, covers it, that describes them all. But basically, postures that can't be held indefinitely. I think that's quite a significant right. mm-hmm. um, development. Uh, and, and we only see that in texts about a thousand years ago. They appear in texts about a thousand years ago. And also in the material record, one of the really exciting discoveries of the project was completely by luck, as all the best discoveries are. We came across this, um, this sort of decorated, sculpted, uh, ornamental gate in Gujarat in a small town called Dabhoi that was built in 1230 and, and happened and we, we noticed that up in the up in the sort of eaves of it the rafters if you can call it that when it's made of stone all these figures doing complex uh, you know balancing arsenals headstands and so forth and that's actually much the earliest such depictions by about 300 years so but what i used to think was that these practices were must must be ancient but then only got written down about a thousand years ago now i think the weight of evidence is so strong that in fact they appear. They only that it's an innovation about a thousand years ago. And prior to that, as you say, all you have are seated postures for meditation, and then like really tough uh, sort of physical mortifications as part of the notion of tapas. You know, of, de- of developing tapas in the body. So quite the opposite of how yoga is understood now, generally as being a method of cultivating the body then until about a thousand years ago the attitude towards the body was one of sort of subjugation or mortification uh, through these sort of penance type things of you know holding your arms up in the air for years on end or standing up for years on end that kind of thing so yeah it seems to me that there's a sort of quantum shift about a thousand years ago and that is then enshrined or uh, formalized in these sanskrit texts on on hatha yoga and that's um, yeah that's when 
that's when the physical practices do become a bit more therapeutic. I think that that's the right word. To some extent, some of them are also, you know, what the the the, the sort of academic word is soteriological. Mm. You know, they're mm. for um, for the spiritual path. Some of them are said to have um, some spiritual benefits, but that's quite unusual. Generally, they yeah they seem just to be therapeutic, and in fact, that is that does reflect my experience of how sadhus would use them in india i mean to some extent some of them will do a few asanas a few balancing headstands and so forth as part of uh, that practice i mentioned earlier the duni tat where you sit surrounded by fire in the in the hot months but otherwise not many sadhus of my acquaintance so my guru for example would not do you know, he he did an he did an intensive sort of seven years of hardcore training where he lived jowl you know cheek by jowl site absolutely at the feet of his guru from the age of about sort of 13 to 20 or something like that and so then he then he would have been doing extremely intensively but after that he would only do asanas i mean he had his daily sort of meditational devotional practice but he would only do asanas intermittently you know for example uh after a week at a kumbh mela when we had just been sitting around <laughs> doing not very much at all he's like okay i'm beginning to feel a bit stiff and i'll do some headstands and stuff to so that really would be therapeutic. The asanas would be kind of a means to an end that you'd kind of have a course of it and get something in the body or, you know, get some kind of understanding and then kind of, you know, move on. Yeah, they would very much, I mean, very much sort of preparatory or therapeutic to keep your, keep your body in good, in good nick, good shape, ready for the, for the higher practices. Yeah, that seems to be how they're understood. I mean, there are, Within the textual tradition as well, and some postures, some physical activities are meant to have more kind of spiritual benefits. But particularly in his tradition, it was more about um, more about making you know prepare, making yourself able, uh, ready to 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 meditate and perform your devotional duties as well. Because the Ramanandi Sampradaya, which I'm part of, is you know, primarily a, a devotional tradition. So the you know the yogis are, yogis are somewhat anomalous in, in in that tradition, and he would just say so he would say that through doing all his yoga and his other practices that would just prepare him that would make him as ready as possible for divine grace. You know, he, he his argument was that you can't say he would say you you, you you can't say if you do these practices you will get enlightened. It's not like that. He said you can get yourself in the sort of best best state possible. To be a recipient of of divine grace and have the sort of ultimate experience, and you and he he had had that experience. Uh, no, he wouldn't claim to be enlightened. No, he wouldn't claim to. He he, you know, he said he'd had occasional sort of beatific moments, but no. Um, and and as we were, I think we, before when we were just chatting beforehand, for him also, and for for sadhus of his tradition. Um, you know the ultimate attainment is just to be able to serve in a serve your 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 chosen deity in a devotional fashion forever so it's a slight a slightly different conception as well of of uh, yeah life. very much more people um, think of the west that you're going to But no he of- wouldn't he would say basically he'd done everything yeah, he, he would say he'd done everything to get himself ready, prepared for that state. But um, you know, then he was kind of waiting to be to be transported there. So maybe he has. Been, <laughs> where, where does uh, where does Kundalini come into all this in terms of yoga? I mean, now there's a lot of talk about raising the kund, um, and I often wonder about all the. I mean, if you look at all the yoga posters, hell of a lot of them are to do with the pelvic floor, aren't they? I mean, in terms of the lotus positions and all, all you know, all this, this, this stuff with the hips, right? Like if you're looking at just the calisthenics therapeutically for the body, you would never put in so much lotus stuff, right? So it seems to point to some kind of interest with the raising energy from that level. Yeah, although, I mean, I think, you know, when we go way back looking at a textual tradition way back to the time of the buddha and so forth and people were sitting in lotus posture then and we don't really see any indications of the that the it, that the purpose is for so it's just a steady seat uh, assisting or making some kind of vital energy rise up the central channel yes a steady seat exactly but later on what i mean you you, talk, you asked about kundalini and 
that sort of Kundalini is historically not present across all traditions. And in fact, the sort of early origins of Kundalini is still a bit murky. I think someone, there still remains uh, a good amount of work to be done on this because, in fact, in some of the earliest treatments, um, Kundalini is an obstacle. You know, it's like a, a block at the bottom of the central channel that needs to be needs to be unlocked. But there is an an, uh, an old notion even before the Hatha Yoga text and going back to probably you know, at least two thousand years of uh, the mystical experience being accompanied by the the rising of some kind of vital energy up the central channel. You know, early on, usually understood as as uh, breath. You know, um, and so we get early references to this idea of udgata as well. So through prolonged breath retention, there's this notion that then the breath will burst up the central channel. And, and in fact, some texts say you need a, a, a solid, steady asana seated position to protect mm, yourself mm. for that, you know, because your body might suddenly start mm, convulsing mm-hmm. or shake or fall over. And that's that's one of the, you know, some texts say you need, that's why you need a, a, a steady asana for that. And then it's over the course of the sort of last, well, I guess from about 12th, 13th century on, um, Kundalini becomes more and more important uh, within the, the yogic traditions. But the, the first text, so the Amrita Siddhi, for example, is uh, the first text to teach uh, any of these physical methods which come to be called Hatha Yoga. That doesn't mention Kundalini. It's all about raising the breath, raising Bindu, which is semen, uh, and also, well, sorry, not keeping Bindu in the head because it's meant to originate in the head. But this text says that both the there's both a, a male and a female vital principle within the body, within the, the, the one body. Of course, it's talking about male bodies, as almost all Sanskrit texts do. But it says that this, this female principle, rajas, is located within the male body at the bottom of the central channel and then has to be raised up by means of manipulating the breath. So it rises together with the breath up to bindu in the head. And then there are also these sort of more esoteric notions of the sun and the moon also being within the yogic body and the sun needs to be raised up to to the moon in the head so i think that you know the the one sort of constant across the traditions is this idea that the the ultimate yogic experience the mystical experience is accompanied by a a a a sensation of the or not just a sensation but the actual rising of some kind of uh, vital energy up up the central up the central channel and some traditions call that kundalini some call it Rajas, or some just say it's the breath, you know. Um, yeah, but interestingly, Kundalini early on, yeah, there's there's lots to be sort of teased out there. We have a slightly cheeky, provocative note in this book. It's about to come out any day now, the uh, critical edition of this text, the Amrita Siddhi, the first text to teach any of these practices, which to our great surprise, Peter Santo and I, who I edited it with, we discovered was written by Buddhists, not, not Hindus, <laughs> right. not Shaivas, as was previously understood. But we look into, so uh, tantric Buddhist texts from about the 8th century onwards, they have this idea of chandali. There's a kind of, a chandala is a, is a low caste, uh, low caste person in, um, you know, in, in, in Indian society from that time. The word doesn't really get used now, but so chandali would be a low caste woman. But that, basically prefigures the notion of kundalini because she is said to you know in conjunction with these practices that come to be called tummo in the tibetan traditions of, of cultivating the inner heat she's said to rise up the central channel and that seems actually to be the to prefigure kundalini I, I, and i think the the understandings of kundalini are perhaps derived from this earlier buddhist notion of chandali um but yeah I, I just a so across traditions, there are different notions of, of what it is, but there's a there's a broad consensus that success in yoga practice involves something rising up the central channel. Oh, there are many ways we can go from this point, but um, I thought I'm thinking when you're talking like this, and also in, ter- <laughs> in also in terms of the you know the roots of yoga that you co-authored with Mark. Um, a lot of it's comparative, isn't it? A lot of your work is just looking at all this. I mean, it's not like you've got just like essentially one text, like a Bible or something, right? Like you've got all these various texts and with all kind of different different methods and also different conce- con- um, conceptualizations of an ends, right? Like they're all different. The aims are different even. So you're, when you call yourself a philologist, which I think, you know, people have debated with you quite a lot, right? Um, that, it's, that's, that for me seems to be a clear answer as to, you're compared. You're, you're, the bulk of your work is just 
comparing all these different texts and trying to kind of like come to some kind of perspective on it all. Yeah, that's true. And I, mean, I think, as I, as I said earlier, the kind of driving force behind my academic work really has been trying to understand that, um, that, that the world that I've lived in in India and my, my, my guru's world and, and his, uh, his understandings of yoga and, and they come about because of, you know, there's a lot of intertwined, entangled traditions, things, lots of things have, have sort of flowed together and apart and so forth over, over the centuries. Um, and in order to understand that, you know, you need to tease those different influences, those different, uh, traditions apart. And yeah, and that, that involves looking at, you know, so, so for example, you know, he, like with, with Kundalini and the chakras, when they're first talked about in text, they're very much things that you create through meditation. Yet my guru would say things like, you know, by doing busty and putting a, a bamboo pipe, uh, in the. Uh, in, in, into your nether, you know, into your rectum and, and performing an auto enema on yourself, that would help him control the Muladhara chakra, which is, which we do find in later texts. But, you know, trying to trace these developments of, you know, because if you look at an early text, it just says that the Muladhara chakra is something that you visualize. And how come doing a physical practice is going to work on that? So you have to look at all these different, different traditions and how they come together. Uh, to understand where yoga is now, I think, and well, what I have, you know, one of the one of the things I've realised in sort of scholarly work or trying to make sense of it at all is if you can find the first text in a tradition, that makes life a lot easier. So, for example, I mean, we in the in Roots of Yoga, we include a lot of translations from a text called Nishwasa Tattva Sanghita, which um, various brilliant the sort of trio of brilliant uh, Sanskritists my kind of gurus Sanskrit gurus they edited and published in 2014 and that's the first Shaiva tantric text that we know of so that's quite you know studying that is great because it's the first one you don't have to understand much of what came before because it's all innovative innovative and the, and the same is um same is true of the Amrita Siddhi this first uh, Hatha yogic text that I've been talking about because it's the first one to teach all this all this material. Um, even though there are contextual things that you a lot of contextual stuff that you need to understand to to make sense of it, they're not drawing directly on earlier traditions. So you, you know, there's no nothing you can you need to go back to to understand exactly what's going on in the text. You just work, you just read the text itself. So, but those texts are a few and far between. And then, you know, once you get to, for example, the Hatha Pradipika or the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, as, as people quite often call it, that is, you know, Swatmarama himself, the composer of the text, he says at the beginning, you know, I've composed this to help everyone, you know, uh, to, to, to cast a light into this darkness caused by there being so many different teachings around. And then he draws on at least 20 different texts. So he's combining teachings from lots of earlier texts. And as a result, it, to, you know, to make sense of it is, is pretty tricky because there are so many different things going on. But, I, you know, to, to understand the, the modern manifestation, I mean, it gets even more complicated, doesn't it, over the course of the last hundred years as well? Because now, or even the last 10 years, suddenly this, you know, to make sense of some of the manifestations of yoga today, <laughs> you've, got to, uh, there's a, you've got to make sense of a, a hell of a lot of different influences, if you, you know. You know, like Marx showing with with yoga body, you know there are this the sort of global physical culture movement then starts influencing yoga in the in the twentieth century. So that's a whole extra uh, body of um, yes yeah. body of practice and knowledge that you need to make sense of to understand understand yoga. Where does the the word hatha yoga come from then? Does it start in the Pradipika or is it has it got roots before that? And I suppose just for the record, I mean, do you, do you want to say? I mean, does it mean sun moon or is it forceful? I think you're definitely uh, are on the side of I like your definition of another <laughs> podcast I think Jacob's podcast where you say it means doing something bloody mindedly in English or oh, we have this word bloody minded and it's a, it's I'd say, it's a, it's a, <laughs> okay, I really yeah. like that definition of Hatha Yoga being bloody minded yeah absolutely yeah well that's really that's kind of what the word Hatha itself means okay that's the key kind of key first thing to understand is that Hatha means force Okay, if you do something like there's an ad the Sanskrit adverb hatat or hatena, and that that means you know you're 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 really trying to do it forcefully and yet like you say bloody bloody mindedly you know to the exclusion of everything else. If you look it up in the Sanskrit dictionaries, stubborn 
<laughs> <laughs> right, because people talk about hatha now as being the sort of gentle, gentle yes, approach, yes, don't they? Yeah, but exactly. the word itself, well, the word the word hatha is is ancient. The, the word hatha is a the the, the the Sanskrit word is ancient, uh, meaning force. But in terms of you know, in the context of religious practice, we first find it in Buddhist texts, huh. um, which again has been. I mean, I, so I've been sort of sent down this whole new rabbit hole over the last few years by the discovery that this text, the Amrita Siddhi, the first text of uh, of this Hatha Yoga tradition, was written by Buddhists, Tantric Buddhists, and so I've been trying to make sense of that both on the ground you know, in India, going to the temples identifying the locations where this transition happened, but also looking into the text. And so, as I mentioned earlier, in the context of Vajroli, the first usages of Hatha Yoga in texts are found in Tantric Buddhist texts, and they, they are to refer to this sort of somewhat heterodox approach to sexual ritual in which the male partner doesn't ejaculate. But then, then that then the term gets taken on by a a Hindu author, a follower of Shiva in about the 12th century, who took the teachings of the Amrita Siddhi and then the name Hatta from a different different text and put them together. And so he called this the the the, the he, he presented a kind of s- summary just in 10 or 10 or 20 verses of the 300 verses of the Amrita Siddhi and said this is Hatha Yoga. And then that so the practices then only included uh, Mahamudra, Mahabandha and Mahaveda. Okay, and then that got expanded in some subsequent texts. So, with more more mudras were added: Ketri Mudra, Vajroli Mudra, Viparita Karani, etc. So, until the Hatha Pradipika, Hatha Yoga was really only these mudras. And then the Hatha Pradipika, Swatnarama says, right, Hatha Yoga is those mudras, but it's also complex asanas and complex breathing techniques, kumbhakas. And from then on, you know, that's the sort of blueprint. That's the model of Hatha Yoga. But he, um, in the Amrita Siddhi, as I mentioned earlier, one of the sort of esoteric, or one of the, the one of the, the the explicit purposes of the of the yoga practices taught is to unite the sun and the moon. So the idea is that the sun is at the bottom of the central channel, the moon is at the top, and you've got to lift the raise the sun up the central channel to join it with the moon. Um, so, but it's not until in fact, as part of the recent project, the Hatha Yoga project, we've been editing 10 texts, one of which Jason Birch has been focusing on, and it's the Yoga Bija, and that's the, it means the seed of yoga. And that's the first text to include this definition of Hatha Yoga, where heart means sun and tat means moon, and their union, their yoga, is Hatha Yoga. Okay, but in fact, looking at the manuscripts of this text, it seems it's, it's pretty clear that verse doesn't get added until probably the 16th century. Okay, so it's not, you don't find that definition in the Hatha Pradipika, which is written probably about 1400. And what I think is going on there, and it doesn't quite make sense as well. It's, it's definitely a sort of, you know, an attempt after the fact to, to redefine Hatha. And I think that's because, because of the unwanted connotations of the term hatha meaning you know bloody mindedness or or taking you know doing something to extremes some people didn't like that that notion um because and one of the reasons why it seems to be art, an artificial definition is that in we get there's lots of huge voluminous dictionaries of uh mantra syllables and what they mean and so forth and i've trawled through them as is jason and none of them say that heart means sun and tat means moon, or is it the other way around? Sun is moon. I think heart is sun and tat is moon. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, but uh, none of them say that. Yeah. You know, yeah. literally none. And we've looked at hundreds of instances of this. So it seems to have just been made up, I think, partly to do away. So, so obviously this, this idea of uniting the sun and the moon is, is, is true to the teachings of the Amrita Siddhi and other Hatha Yoga texts, but this identification of the word Hatha with sun and moon is is an artificial thing, I think. Again, to do away with the unwanted connotations of the word Hatha. And because nowadays, in yeah, I mean, nowadays, if you like, if you go to a Kumbh Mela and you wander around and you ask someone, you know, you say, I, I really want to meet a Hatha Yogi. 
okay you'll be taken to someone who does some really crazy <laughs> stuff you know maybe stands stands up for years on end or or spends the spends the winter sitting in frozen frozen pools of water hatha yoga is now it's not understood as we would understand it at all it's not even understood in in the way that um you know we would understand it from the hatha yoga pradipika or hatha pradipika it basically means extreme mm, ascetic mm, mm. practice and it was explained to me um he has explained to me by this Daniela and I during the Hatha Yoga project went to see this uh, sadhu on Mount Abu um, in far south of Rajasthan. Actually, I've met him a few times before. Murli Das, very nice, very nice uh, Ramanandi, and we we're talking to him, asking him about it. A friend of my guru, and he said, you know, so we'd gone up, you know, gone up on the bus, and now we'd driven up, driven up to Abu, up a winding kind of mountain road that went through lots of hairpins and. And uh, so we're, we're sitting up there in his cave, his amazing cave. And he said, um, you know, so Hatha Yogi, you know, you came up, you came up through that winding track and you'll go down. You know, if you were to walk down, you'd take the winding path down. The Hatha Yogi, if he wants to get down to the bottom of the mountain, he'll just run straight down. Oh. You know, that's how it says basically you you have an objective and you just go straight for it and damn the consequences, damn anything else that might happen. Just get there. So it's, it's kind of quite immoral, really, isn't it? Or potentially kind of, you know, Kind of anti-social. Um, is that why? I mean, is that, is that why? Kind of potentially, the yoga sutras have seemed to have kind of been kind of sequestered and taken to hatha yoga. When we, maybe one might, if one's studying hatha yoga, read another book other than the sutras. I mean, have, have, has has potentially sutras got anything to do with the hatha yoga at all, or are they just a, a kind of easy way to kind of get back into the ten, ten commandments? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I always think it's ironic that it's that, that you know that that Patanjali's been been so sort of valorized within the modern yoga tradition. I mean, it's it's, it's very difficult as well. I mean, let's face it; it's probably the hardest Ooh. yoga text out there to Ooh. understand. And I really think, I mean, Patanjali himself, strange, even though from about eight nine hundred years ago he starts being deified in South India, but then. More as a naga, you know, he's kind of he's depicted with a snake's body, isn't he? As, and being one of these sort of semi-divine naga naga beings, but not as a um, not as a master yogi. And within the tradition, within the textual tradition, within the living tradition, he's no he's not not uh, not remembered as a yogi. Basically, he was a scholar. You know, he was a, a, a brilliant genius scholar who formalized. You know, who who described the the mental meditative processes that go on during yoga. Um, but yeah, totally irrelevant to the basic practices of Hatha Yoga. I mean, I think you could always argue that it's totally, he's totally relevant to the practices of meditation yeah. and, and the, you know, trying to understand the, the states of samadhi and so forth that you're aiming for. But in terms of asana practice is totally irrelevant. I mean, the, the asanas that he teaches are all seated postures for meditation. Um, so yeah, definitely not, not relevant to doing a, a, a series of dynamic linked postures. Right? I, I mean, that didn't, it wasn't even going on then. It wasn't going on for a, for a very long time. So, um, well, at the same time, it does reflect, you know, what happens in the Indian tradition as well, that uh, the different spiritual or different religious lineages or traditions in India always have a root text associated with them. And that does tend to get valorized, but, uh, not necessarily used or I don't know just it just yeah I was when Mark and I were putting Roots of Yoga together and we translated I mean we borrowed translations from others but I think we translated over a hundred different passages from over a hundred different texts and the hardest one of them all is Patanjali you know it's it's definitely a scholarly work and you it's 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 difficult Sanskrit and contextually it's really difficult to make sense of in that there is there are a lot of borrowings from Buddhist traditions as well the like when you're trying to translate Patanjali, the the usual Sanskrit dictionary is pretty useless. And I found uh, I find that there's a, there's, uh, there's a Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit dictionary by someone called Edgerton, which is much more useful because the the terms seem to generally be have been borrowed from Buddhist traditions. But even there, they're pretty esoteric and arcane. So yeah, it's pretty pretty heavy heavy way into the yoga tradition. There are there are plenty easier. Easier, easier text to start with. I think. Also, because he start, he kind of seemed to be talking a lot about yamas and niyamas. Where I mean, did you have that code of conduct 
stress particularly in your aesthetic tradition and experience of um yeah to some extent i mean there are there are lots of difficulties there but yeah it's it certainly it's hard as you're expected to live to a high life of sort of moral mm, rectitude mm. um but there are some things that are a bit confusing as well you know the so my my sect or the the the, the sampradaya i'm associated with like various other ones has a kind of military wing and how do you square that with ahimsa and non-violence and in fact i saw my my guru get in a fight <laughs> once and, and he you know he said that was fine because he'd, he'd been uh i was <laughs> It was guys a long time ago, and I was. Um, it was uh, actually because I listened to Edwin Bryant's yeah. um, your your chat with him, and it was in it was in Mathura, Brindavan, and it was in August. I was there for Janmashtami, so Krishna's birthday, effectively, and then lots of sadhus converged there. And I was there's this lovely old uh, sadhu called Moni Baba because he'd been silent for twenty seven years or something. Um, and he had an ashram, Gyara number Fatak, on the on the Parikrama Road. And there was a whole a whole load of us. There was sort of colonnade, and we were lined up. We'd all put our our sons out. You know, so yeah. The, I mean, the when you talk about an asan in the sadhu world, it doesn't mean a yoga posture. It means where oh, you're oh, sleeping oh. and sitting. So we'd all line. We're all kind of lined up along this long colonnade, and uh, um um. We can't. It was because it was uh, sort of festival time, sort of party time. There were non-stop bandaras, feasts, where you'd go to someone else's ashram, and there'd be, you know, everyone would get together, be a feast, and and it's and because it's hot season as well, a lot of bung gets drunk. Okay, so the bung mm. being, you know, the, yeah. the cannabis drink that's it's a green liquid, and that's everyone. Everyone gets right into that. It's very popular in Mathura, and we'd been off to uh, one of these bandaras. We'd just drunk drunk buckets of bun <laughs> and it could always go either way with my guru you know he could either be very happy but if you if we went the wrong way you could get pretty spicy on bun <laughs> and uh but it was hot afternoon we'd eat we'd eaten quite well so we were coming to go and lie down on our arsons and there was this bubba there most of the bubbers there we knew they're all kind of old friends or young you know young sardis but everyone knew them but there was one sort of old guy you didn't really fit in and he was next to me i think how was it? I think he was on my left and Babaji was on my right. And this old guy started saying, started accusing Babaji of having, he, he had this plastic sheet, which again, no pucker, Tiagi, you know, the, the, the tradition I was with, they all have sort of natural materials. You wouldn't wander around with a plastic sheet at all. And he had this plastic sheet that he put his blanket on or something. And there was a little cut in it. And he was, uh, he started accusing Babaji of having <laughs> cut his plastic sheet. And, and it just kicked off and I'm lying back. And then he's on the left and Babaji's on the right. And then they just, just went for each other. And uh, there was sort of bits of beard flying around. I remember having to clear bits of, and I just sort of, sort of wriggled out from underneath them. And, um, and then all these other bubbers piled in, all these young, other young bubbers, sort of similar age to me. I was pretty young at the time. I was born even younger, but I was probably 22, 23. And, uh, and then the guy, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like they gave him a really good kicking. Just it's sort of in, Indian fights are interesting like that. There's a lot of sort of performativity to it and, and not so much actual punching or anything like that. Anyway, it was over pretty quickly and, the guy picks up his stuff and sort of shuffles off. Basically, he's got to leave. You know, it was it was, it was bad form. But then the um, then the, the all the other young the young bubbers around turned to me, or one of them said, "Hey, Jagdish, why the hell didn't you get involved?" Jagdish was my my is my sort of initiatory name. Why, why didn't you get involved and, and help your guru in, in the fight? And I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> and and one of them and another one said, "No, no, don't worry about. It. He's a student. He doesn't fight. It's okay. He's a student." Uh, okay, few, few. I've been let off there. Yeah, <laughs> well, just... yeah, exactly. I was just totally. Free. I was like, "What the hell's going on here?" Well, I couldn't believe what was going on. Yeah, but yeah, for them, you know. So you t talking about yamas yeah. and niyamas, and, and, and then they have sort of organised regiments, and throughout the 18th century, in particular, there were loads of fights going on. You know, so they see. You know, we think our oh, inside everyone's got to be totally peaceful and. Um, not engage in any kind of violence. They don't really see it like that. Um, you know, the, if it's justified, it, it's allowed. But that, I still, I still don't really understand it. I still don't really understand how you can reconcile those positions. But generally, you know, they are, despite having somewhat 
confusing ethical, moral yeah. principles yeah. like that, there is very much a very much an understanding of of how one should behave. And I've always thought I was asked. I've been asked about this before. You know, in the context of modern, you know, these perennial, constant um, scandals with big yoga mm, gurus mm. these days. And one of the ways that is sort of dealt with within the, the sadhu tradition, at least, is by these, these regular festivals when they all come together. And if there's any, you know, if there's any suspicions, if there's any suggestions that someone's been misbehaving, you know, back at their ashram or something, or say, you know, say someone, say a sadhu has, has apparently got, got himself a girlfriend or something, which is off for various reasons, not just because of the, you know the the uh, bad effects on their spiritual practice, and that's not what they're meant to do. But also, there's a there's a there's a problem because if if a sadhu marries and has a family, they might end up leaving their property to the family, so that it's then lost from you know if they've inherited a big nice temple and ashram somewhere, and they then then all gets confusing. So there's that side of it as well as a kind of monetary aspect, as well as the the spiritual aspect. But that will then get raised. That will then get brought up at um, at, uh, at at at, at these festivals and there'd be like a council gathering and if someone's misbehaved then they'll be punished for it or cast out or something so i always say you know people i quite often get asked you know how do i find a guru i said well that's you know that's that's a very tricky question but if you go to a kumbha mela because it, it, obviously it's difficult to be sure if someone's pucker you know you don't you know you, you don't want to pick pick someone dodgy but generally if someone if a, i mean there are exceptions but if a sadhu is able you know, has a prominent position at one of these kumbha melas and is clearly mm, respected by mm. his peers and so forth is likely to be mm. pukka. You know, there is a so there's a kind of peer review. My point is that there's a there's a regular process of yeah, peer review, exactly. exactly yeah, you know, yeah. That you're kept in check. You have to you have to you have to keep the side up. Whereas I think you know, yeah, you know, one of the problems with the you know with the sort of translation to the West of yoga traditions is there's not you know people end up for being put on this huge pe pedestal and there's no no peer review process, I think. All right. Um, I've got time for one more question. Yeah. Um, what about vinyasa? I mean, people are going to be asking that because obviously it's you know, predominantly Ashtanga yoga that people are doing on this, you know, listening to this podcast, right? So where does this vinyasa come in? Um, is it? And what about the Yoga Karunta? Have you ever heard of that book? Um, it seems to me that the early asanas only talk about static postures. Um, is there relevance in vinyasa okay well what we you're right about static postures apart from we do see a development over the last two three hundred years so we see coming into tech so that, you know there's an argument that all dynamic mm -mm. yoga practice is, is as a result of sort of global globalization and some interaction with these sort of global physical culture trends. But no, we do see sort of small, you know, very kind of tentative steps in that direction in the uh, in our textual sources. So there's a text called the, I think it's the Hatha Tattva Kalmadi from the 18th century, which introduces things called charanas, which are kind of dynamic movements. But again, they're very much preliminary. They're meant to be, you know, for making the body ready for the higher practices of yoga. But they are kind of identified with asana, but they're things like, you know, swinging your arms around 10 times right. one way and 10 mm. times the other. Uh, and then you ask about the yoga kurunta. So I've worked on this text called the Hatha Abhyasa Padati with Mark and Jason as part of the, uh, the, the Hatha Yoga project. And there's a reason which I always kind of dismissed it, but there does seem to be some connection between that text and this notion of a yoga kurunta. Because the teachings in this Hatabhyasa Padati text are attributed to someone called Kapala Kuruntaka. Okay, I think that's probably too much of a coincidence. But it's hard. I mean, okay, it's a while since I've looked at this, but I, you know, we've, uh, Mark and Jason have looked into it much more than I have. But I don't think we can kind of definitively say that it is the Yoga Kurunta, but I think that there's some, you know, there's definitely, definitely interaction or some relationship or some influence going on there. Um, but that text, so it teaches, I mean, among other things, it has a really long, long discourse on Vajrayali Mudra, uh, strangely enough, one of the most detailed treatments of that. But the bulk of the text is descriptions of 112 postures, I think it is. 
some of which are dynamic movements. Okay, so sort of, you know, there's one actually I was looking at yesterday, the Harin Asana, the deer, deer Asana, where you, you meant to, like a gazelle or something, you meant to sort of jump up and then kick your heels against your buttocks. Yeah, so dynamic and do that repeatedly. So there are dynamic <laughs> yeah. movements. Uh, I'm then I'm slightly at odds with Jason because we were editing this text together and it should be published sooner or later. And Mark is on the fence. I mean, and, and he says to me that he he kind of agrees <laughs> with me, but I don't know if he says if he yeah, it's just sitting on the fence. But Jason is. J J Jason thinks that the way the asanas are taught in that text and the Hatabhyasa Padati, that they're to be performed sequentially. Okay. I, I don't think they are. I don't see you know, there's no there's no explicit statement in the text saying do this one, then do this one, and do this in a series oh. and so forth. Um and it's quite a complex argument, but one of the key things I think is that that text is then borrowed, is then used to uh to lots of yoga. Uh, descriptions of yoga postures from that text are then taken for this and put in this text called the Sri Tattva Nidhi, which Norman Sjoman produced. And, you know, he, he, he wrote a lot about in his book, is it the yoga of the Mysore hmm, tradition yeah, or the Mysore yeah. palace mm -hmm. tradition, something right. like that. Um, and then the orders completely jumbled mm. up. So that text takes these, these postures from the Hatha Vyasa Padati and reorders them. So if the order was of any importance, then that, that would be pretty crazy. So I, yeah, so that's, I don't think there are any, well, actually, funny enough, the very first text to teach any of these methods of Hatha Yoga, the, um, the Amrita Siddhi, which is a thousand years old, its three practices are to be done in sequence, in fact. But other than that, we don't find any clear cut sequential practices in any pre modern text. And I always say, you know, I always think that, in fact, I, ironically, I don't know if it's ironic, but the Tibetan tradition has a very old um, notion, very old teachings of sequential mm, mm. dynamic physical postures, sometimes called, well, in Tibetan called trul core or, or magical movement. So, and there, there certainly aren't, you know, from what I understand about vinyasa, so the, um, the kind of linking movements or linking practices, you, you would know about, I don't really know about this, but there's at certainly no, precedent. no right. treatment of that okay. within, um, okay. with any pre-modern text at all. No precedent whatsoever. And also, I mean, interestingly, Surya Namaskara. Yeah, yeah sorry yeah, about I that. Know, I know. <laughs> but I, yeah. and I know that, I mean, this is basically what Mark <laughs> said in his book, isn't it? And I know there was a lot of backlash then, but it seems to me, I feel you would probably have a better finger on the, on the pulse than I have about this, but, um, I feel that that, backlash that sort of kicking back against Marx's thesis has rather died down um, in that it's pretty incontrovertible. I mean, there is, there was one guy, there was an American yoga teacher who was doing a PhD. I think he's abandoned it. And he was very sort of vocal about, oh, I found evidence in the tantras for linked practices of of asanas, but it was nonsense. I mean, it, but he was, you know, it's interesting these days in the days of social media, people, if they shout loud about these things, then they get picked up. And so eventually I published a rebuttal, just pointing out that what he was saying was completely absurd because the, the text that he was referring to absolutely did not say what he, he claimed they were saying. Uh, but that was two or three years ago now. And I don't, you know, no, people don't seem to say it anymore. I think people, I think it's, you know, there's that, I guess it's like the stages of grief in a way. I don't want to overplay it, but, you know, first of all, you're in denial, aren't you? This yeah, can't yeah, be right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I think people have come, come to a reconcilement. Yeah. And in the Ashtanga community, the community, there have been bigger earthquakes yeah, since as well. Yeah. Other, so other distractions. But Mark was definitely the bogeyman for a while. Yeah, yeah, and Paul, I mean, Mark, Paul Mark, because of course he then gets sort of, um, you know, willfully misinterpreted as saying it doesn't oh, matter just because, yeah, just because it's got no precedent, that it's not important. Yeah, yeah, which is not what he was saying at all. Which is uh, yeah, which is not what he's saying as well. Yeah, he's saying that lots of bits of it are old, but then bits of it are new as well. And also, it kind of, and I think what he's also highlighting is the sort of genius of the of the Indian teachers of the early 20th century. You know, mm, Krishnacharya mm. is you know they developed this this thing that was obviously perfect for the conditions of the time because look what it's done. It's gone hugely global, and it probably wouldn't have done if they hadn't done that. You know? So yeah, um, but yeah, there's certainly you know in, through the course of our research the last five years we haven't haven't found any any 
any any more evidence or or any evidence at all to overturn oh, Mark's keep thesis looking there. keep <laughs> Keep, keep eyes on me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but having said that, you know, like like as I started saying, like Surya Namaskar as well. There's no evidence for that complex sequence of me. I mean, conceivably, people were were just sort of prostrating themselves and getting up. But that said, you know, I still, if I'm when I do a yoga session, a yoga practice, I start it off with a few rounds of Surya Namaskar, and I, you know, it's great, isn't it? it makes you feel good. It get it w- wakes you up. You're, pro- you know, it makes you think about the sun and so forth and the right and it's great well also yeah as you say if it's a pro- if it's a protestation if it's a you know simply a you know a um what how do you what do you call it um yeah a uh when you when you um a devotional aspect when you're lying down and getting up well, what do you call that now yeah prostration yeah prostration 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 <laughs> prostration if it's a prostration there's a huge precedent for that though isn't there really if you think about it right from you know People doing it originally. I mean, the Tibetans have the prostration practices, you know, that I guess they're pretty old and it, more or less it's a prostration. So maybe we Absolutely. could find a precedent for it after all. Um, pro- yeah, but, well, the, but the extra bits, you know, the 12 different positions, there's no, there's certainly no forerunners for that. And in fact, in fact, the, um, in the, the one, the only mention we get of it in a, in a pre modern yoga text is in a, 19th century commentary on the Hatha Pradipika, where Brahman under the commentator says that he's, he's commenting on a bit where it says you shouldn't do, uh, kaya klesha vidhi. So observances that are harmful to the body. And when he comments on that, he says, yeah, you shouldn't do a lot of things like Surya Namaskara or weightlifting. So he's just clearly thing. <laughs> grouping it, and, and then it probably just meant repeated prostrations anyway. But he's he's he clearly doesn't see it as part of yoga. You know, it's something else. Um, but yeah, like I say, so, you know, yoga has has been evolving nonstop since it since it appeared, whenever it appeared, first millennium BC, and there's it's constantly been absorbing or, and, and uh, other influences and changing. And you know, there's no point in trying to search for an original authentic yoga and do whatever you know do whatever works best I it's also kind of a shame isn't it to kind of like cut it off and say well it doesn't you know yoga isn't really valid unless it was before like it you know like 1950s when yenga came out of india you know because it's you know it's evolving before then and now it's evolving just in a more global manner so you know the whole thing continues yeah yeah, I mean, that's one thing we see, like I said, you do see these developments from a few hundred years ago where dynamic postures start coming in. in yeah, the even tradition. before the Yenga. Yeah, um, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it was evolving in that direction. So I, that, that's quite mysterious. I don't know quite know why that happened. Yeah, kind of British in India, wasn't it? And the sweet, something to do with Swedish um, gymna- gymnastic movements, if I remember Mark's, um, Mark's book. <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah, but that's, that's the 20th century or was the late it? 19th yeah. century stuff. But prior to that, there's already developments going on in india yeah a little bit it definitely become this definitely you know the number of asanas taught proliferates and then we get these small some dynamic movements but not sequences as i said so it had its own sort of momentum of of development in india as well before any engagement with with global modernity well, before we get loads of other people um chiming in here on the podcast and telling us where it came from um i'll maybe leave it there with you um <laughs> we've We've done lo- loads more time than I thought because it's been actually a really, I really enjoy speaking to you actually. Um, just get, look, you know the format. Just give me one uh, inspiration, something inspires you and uh, a guilty pleasure. And, and don't say you're not guilty of anything. Just to round it off. Just a bit of fun. Oh gosh, something that inspires me. I didn't, I'd forgotten about that. But I remember the guilty pleasure. Um, uh, the Narmada River, something that inspires me. The Narmada River is is one of my favourite places in India, and I'm dying to get back there. It hasn't been a, it's been a couple of years, but I spent many many happy months or years even on the banks of the Narmada River. My guru has an ashram there, and then also we used to spend months in Omkareshwar, and I've been up to the source of it with my daughter when she was only about six months old. That was fantastic. So that's the place that really inspires me. Um, Narmada Har, as they say on the on the banks of it, O River Narmada, take away my my sorrows. So it'd be good to get back there and have have all the the, the sufferings of the last couple of years taken away. I look forward to that. And um, guilty pleasure. Well, 
I suppose sometimes it's guilty, but one thing I do a lot of when I can, actually I haven't for a month or so because the weather's so terrible, is paragliding. Ah, um, interesting. That's something I've sort of combined with my wanderlust in India and a lot of um, flying around in the Himalayas going on. Long. In fact, I, I say one of my one of my most memorable flights ever was in the company of a dear friend called John Sylvester, who sadly died this year, but not not paragliding. But we um, we managed to fly right up close to Mani Mahesh Kailash, which has a good claim, actually, a reasonable claim to be the original Mount Kailash in Himachal Pradesh. So, yeah, that's my... my I suppose it's guilty because it is somewhat irresponsible and reckless. It's certainly dangerous. So That's a first. And you're doing a new paragliding in India as well. <laughs> Kind of adds another layer of danger in it, really. Yeah, it yeah. loads. Yeah, I, I, every year for about 20, 20 years, I would go up to oh go up to the, the mountains in autumn. Oh. <laughs> that is yeah. irresponsible. So it's guilty, definitely. No, it's fun. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah. So you can. That is a guilty pleasure. Yeah, it's guilty. Yeah, yeah, it's a guilty it's, pleasure. Yeah, it? But it's so yeah. amazing. Like, and you I go off for days on end. You know, you pack the harness with camping gear, and then you can go and land up behind the mountains in the middle of nowhere. And- I get it in the neck just for going out for a swim. For God's sake, to my <laughs> wife, I'm no, going on a paraglider. So really, really irresponsible and dangerous. In the time I think she so likes me getting out of the house. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thanks, mate, yeah, for coming on. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>